Hello and a warm welcome to this edition of the Business Agenda. I'm Kukuletu Tele. Now in this week's episode, we'll be taking a look at the internal controls that companies need to implement in order to ensure that they can avoid the worst case scenario. Now looking at a successive business continuity plan, it can help uh, weathering the risks that are associated with potential recession or a tough economic climate. So the big question that we ask today is how businesses can enable themselves to be fighting fit and be able to absorb the pressures that they faced with and be agile enough to rise to those challenges. Joining me today to answer these uh, tough questions is my esteemed panel of guests, Ms. Dr. Adrian Saville, CIO of Canon Asset Managers and Chief Strategist at the Citadel Group, Tammy Wyman, Managing Director at Accenture Strategy, and Carl Gutter. He is the commercial or from the commercial and uh, banking at Standard Bank. Thank you so much for joining us today, lady and gents. We also are joined by our audience members who will be posing questions, opinions, and their comments to the panel and amongst themselves as well here on the floor today. Well, let's get into the first particular issue. Uh, before one can uh, have a weather or rather a recession-proof strategy in order to weather the storm, let's take a look at the current South African economic landscape, Adrian, and maybe I just want to get your opinions on the floor as to how we fare. At the moment, South Africa's expectations of 2% GDP growth for 2015 not looking too optimistic. The impact that this might have on businesses in South Africa? The economic outlook is, is tough. Um, if you think of where structural growth sits, uh, probably in the region of 3 3.5%. We are consistently punching below that structural growth, and I think a lot of the explanatory factors are you know, well known. But um, as much as business spends time thinking about brand and strategy and leadership and specific markets, the single biggest influence on top line and bottom line business performance is the economic environment. And with this sluggish setting, it, it has to translate into tough times for business. Tammy, I'm sure this is uh, where you can add your opinion as well on uh, the impact that it's having on uh, several clients that you must deal with in your uh, particular business. Yes, certainly. I, I believe that there's a recognition that there is, uh, you know, South Africa is entering into a new era and many businesses are, are trying to understand, you know, what is the strategy then? Is it one of uh, hunkering down and trying to contain cost, um, whereas many businesses have already been going through uh, very significant cost optimization programs. So what we're also encouraging businesses is to look at how do you actually find the pockets of growth within a, within a shrinking economy. Um, one of those is certainly the, the youth, which is challenge and an opportunity at the, at the same time. When you think of uh, in 2020, there'll be one billion Africans of working age. And that will represent actually a quarter of the world's working population. So you can imagine both what an opportunity and a challenge that will present and how that will manifest itself in South Africa as well. So how do you find the employment for them? How do you ensure that this, this youth population is ready for the digital age, ready to enter the digital workforce? And many of our clients are, are coming to us, uh, trying to get advice on, you know, not necessarily weathering the storm, because you can also, you know, there, I think they're well, well proven tactics, but how do you position yourself for the growth once uh, we come out of that? I'm happy that you touched on the pockets of opportunity because it seems as though, Carl, South Africa is not one of those particular pockets, or unless I'm just being a, uh, sharing my negative sentiments here on the South African performance. But Tammy did touch on the growth uh, with regard to the rest of the continent, and it does seem as though SA is the laggard with, uh, with regard to this performance. Our BRICS partners, in particular India and China, are the ones who are leading the pack, and we're still at the tail end of performance together with Brazil. If you look at uh, the African continent, we're the ones that are holding back economic growth in the static region, whereas the West and even the East part of the continent are really p poised and positioned uh, to excel here significantly. Is it all doom and gloom for the SA economy? No, look, I wouldn't say it's all doom and gloom. I, th I think you're quite correct that our growth rates have been substantially lower than the rest of sub-Saharan Africa. I think last year we were sitting at sort of one and a half percent, which was sort of a third of the overall, um, you know, sub-Saharan Africa growth. It's looking a little bit better this year in that we're probably about half of, of, of what the, the growth rate going forward. We are generally lower than, than the, um, the rest of sub-Saharan Africa, but you must also realize we're a much more developed economy. So, you know, that does come into it. And there are some, some green shoots coming through. We, we are, you know, things are better than they were last year. We've had the, the oil price coming down, which, is, which has 
released quite a lot of money back into the pockets of consumers. And while some of that has been eaten up by the increases that have come through again with the levy and the road accident fund, you know, we are expecting oil to be a little bit more stable for the rest of this year. Hopefully the Rand dollar to be a little bit more stable, which, which should mean there'll be a little bit of relief coming through and it will help offset some of the challenges that, that we are having. Obviously our biggest trading partners being China, uh, being China and, and Europe, you know, subdued growth in those spaces, it's not going to be easy. And I think, you know, the, the reality is we are in a, in a tough time and, and probably more tough than in, in the rest of sub-Saharan in Africa, but there are, there are some things that, that we can do to, to, to overcome that, and I guess that's some of the things that we'll, we'll chat about just now. And Adrian, that's where you come in, because I understand there are two particular areas here where South Africa can bolster its economic growth, uh, opening up the doors for some kind of intra-regional trade, as well as a significant investment in infrastructure. Mm -hmm. But looking at the reality of the situation, that at the moment isn't taking place. Yeah, the, the, I don't think you can emphasize enough the the. the incredible tragedy of these uh, xenophobic events of uh, the last week or two. Um, if South African, if the South African economy and South African business sits with a single prospect um, that really represents fantastic opportunity, it's regional economic integration. Yeah. And uh, the sentiment <clears throat> that has been expressed and the actions that have been carried out in the last couple of weeks, uh, absolutely tragic. Um, it, it speaks volumes about, I think, the social fabric of the South African economy, some of the structural and deeply entrenched structural issues we face, uh, such as youth unemployment, grossly skewed income uh, inequality, um, exclusive economic growth rather than inclusive economic growth. And Going back to you know, Carl's observations about uh, the different economic regions, if you think about just the BRICS economies, it's evident that the BRICS economies really should have been just the X economies, India and China, mm. and that the B, the R and the S got left behind. Uh, the, the, the simple explanation, I think, is that none of Brazil, Russia or South Africa have got into the important business of structural change, whereas India and China have. And the two ingredients that you reference, first the infrastructural spend. We have the fiscal latitude and the financial institutions, uh, an incredibly sophisticated banking uh, system, capital markets that make that funding of the infrastructure spend possible. Uh, so it's well within our spending capability. And uh, then uh, opening the economy up to regional economic integration because if economies compete on the basis of economic openness, the best form of openness is to find neighbours rather than uh, other countries per se because the neighbours give you often cultural proximity, ge uh, uh, time zone proximity, geographic transport proximity and so on. Mm. So those are two ingredients that sit right in front of us. I fear that we've got into the business of squandering one and we're watching the other. Your honest opinion uh, regarding South Africa's e expected economic growth uh, projections over the next 10 years? Yeah, you, you know, the 5.4 that's written in the NDP is, uh, it's, it's, it's tooth fairy stuff. Uh, the economy simply doesn't have the structural makeup to deliver that 5.4. Uh, we, we, that doesn't mean we can't do it, but we haven't got into the business of grabbing for those structural elements. And those, the two most important structural elements are putting in place that infrastructural spend. And the beauty of the infrastructural spend is if you spend a dollar on any industry, no industry has more spillovers and multipliers than infrastructure spend. Mm. It absorbs the type of labor and skill that South Africa has in abundance. And the spend stays. You know, the last time we built a power station was in 1980 and it's still here. Uh, so, in, you know, infrastructure spend <clears throat> is a very, very powerful engine and it, it, it mobilizes, it, uh, it enables and it bolsters the, uh, the capability of the economy. And then the question is, if that is what we do, who do we do it with? and the who has to be the neighbourhood, which is the most exciting growth region in the world. Mm. 
Carl, I want to get your sentiments on the tooth fairy analysis that uh, Adrian has given us because we know to spur economic growth, as Adrian mentioned, you need confidence in the private sector that will help create jobs. And as a result, you have uh, a booming economy, which is not taking place in South Africa at the moment. Uh, we do know that there's a low levels of confidence in the South African economy. And with this tooth fairy analysis that I want to go <laughs> back to, uh, doesn't it make your job slightly more difficult uh, from the commercial sector and having to instill confidence in these businesses that operate in the local market? I, th I think it is it is a tough time. I mean, I, th I think the reality is that you know the the five 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 and a half percent that that we were hoping for back in the day is is at this stage probably not achievable. Um, but hopefully we will get back to that point at at some point in the future. I think, you know, we we, we do need to realise it is quite difficult in the South African context at this stage for businesses. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think Adrian touched on those. You know, if you look at the global competitiveness index, uh, you know, the, the things around um, the, the structure of the labour market it's it's, it's very um, very complicated. It's very complex. Um, you know, the education sector, the skills it's it's quite it's quite tough at this stage from a from a skills perspective in business as well to get the right skills. Um, having having said that, you know, there's 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 also a lot of opportunities that come with some of these challenges that we're seeing in the in the economy. I mean, um, one of the nice example that we've got is, you know, the electricity crisis is obviously something that's very topical and it hits a lot of our clients. And you know, we've got clients who are looking at how do you how do you utilize um, generators now to 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 offset some of the the, um, the the issues that are coming through from from the electricity perspective. It's opened up whole new industries around solar panels. You know, something that probably we have to be looking at from a broader global perspective just because of natural resources running out at some point in time. Mm. It's almost being fast tracked a little bit in South Africa because of some of the, the internal issues we've had from an electricity perspective. So, you know, there's opportunities in that as well. We've got some clients, you know, there's quite a lot of solar solar clients popping up um, other than renewable energies as well. So I think there's lots of opportunities within the the sort of um, the context of the low growth rates. Mm. I'm happy you touched on uh, the optimism and the light at the end of the tunnel because maybe this is where you can give us more perspective here, Tammy, uh, with regard to your experience abroad, in particular in the Middle uh, Middle East as well as Asia. Uh, are there things that we can learn from our counterparts and peers in that part of the world that we can implement here in South Africa in trying to uh, weather the storm and make sure that these South African companies have strategies appropriate to find a, a significant growth despite the tough economic environment? Yes. I would say one a very important thing, uh, along with the hard infrastructure, is also the soft infrastructure, health, education, and the um, the public policy that needs to surround that, and and having a confidence in the direction that is set in that for the long term, because these take a very long term, just a long time to see the impact of them. And uh, you know, I think in South Africa, there's been uh, uh, quite a bit of focus on. Uh, probably getting the headline very quickly in the short term, but not understanding the long-term impacts of that. And now we're starting to see the impacts of some of those decisions that were made 15 years ago at ESCOM are now starting to impact the electricity situation. And, uh, you know, I think that, that the um, institutional memory is perhaps a, a bit shorter in South Africa, um, given, you know, the fact that a lot of progress needed to be made in a very short amount of time. And now that South Africa is almost becoming a, a teenager or an adolescent um, in terms of its, its democracy, um, so I think the, the fabric is wearing thin in some of the uh, policies that, you know, have been, have been moving mm. from one side to the other. Certainly in, in my area of expertise, which is the telecom industry, there we can see, you know, the, the multiple change of ministries um, has, has uh, significantly impacted the development, for example, of broadband, which is one of those key enablers to economic growth. And, uh, you know, the, I, I think there's a recognition, uh, and as part of the National Development Plan, that there are certain, uh, certain goals which need to be met, but at the same time, the, the, the basic uh, regulatory measures are still not in place to enable those private companies to make investments to, uh, to actually reach those goals. Mm -hmm. I'm happy you touched on that as well, the NDP, which I hope we can revisit with regard to enabling uh, an environment for commercial success. But the reason why we all gathered here today is obviously to uh, uh, break the rules and uh, create opportunities for growth here and create exceptional exceptionals, mm -hmm. uh, which mm -hmm. refers to a study that you were recently conducted, Adrian, uh, which was on the back of a, uh, a study as well conducted from Columbia University by Rita McGrath, which shows that there are companies that can find exponential uh, economic or rather uh, uh, earnings growth despite the tough economic environment. And walk us through the two characteristics that uh, were highlighted here, agility and absorption. Sure. Just very briefly before going there, I think it's important to flag you know, some observations that Tammy makes, and that is it's not just 
uh, companies that can achieve uh, this escape velocity uh, or defy gravity. It's also countries. Mm. Um, and perhaps uh, we could come back and talk about that. But in the case of businesses, the, the study that we, we did was born out of Rita McGrath's work. She's a professor at Columbia Business School. And she surveyed 5,000 companies over 10 years. And to her great surprise, in the first five-year period, uh, fewer than 10% of businesses were able to produce uninterrupted growth uh, at the top line and the bottom line. And that led her to then say, well, that was a tough period. Let me go and look at a different five years. And she looked at the preceding five years and found that the number went slightly higher, but it was still you know, a sub-20% uh, figure th that these businesses overwhelmingly struggled to achieve uninterrupted growth. And that led to a third, I think, fascinating question, which is, well, if there were some businesses that did uninterrupted growth in the first five-year period and the second five-year period, were there any businesses that did 10 years in a row? Mm. And of these almost 5,000 businesses, just 10. Uh, and these are large companies with market caps bigger than a billion dollars. Uh, well-known uh, global companies, as well as some you know, lesser well-known, uh, more local businesses. And what is staggering in this list of 10 is the <coughs> eclectic and you know, idiosyncratic uh, makeup. And uh, this crazy bazaar of businesses includes the likes of Yahoo Japan, Tsingtao, uh, the Chinese brewer, uh, Koka, which is a Slovenian pharmaceutical business, uh, a, a Spanish construction firm, an Indian bank, uh, an alternative energy business in the United States called Atmos. Mm. These are the 10. Uh, and at first blush, there's, these companies have nothing in common. Uh, but when you peel back the mask and start drilling in, so they don't have common leadership, ownership structures, uh, geographic diversification, they don't work in the same industries. But when you peel back the mask of these uh, what I would call business school commonalities, they have a second level of hidden common attributes. And these common attributes to a business are agility and absorption. Mm -hmm. And agility uh, really takes the form of operational agility, that we can be ultra fit, uh, extra fast, super quick, very efficient. Uh, it could be um, uh, portfolio agility, that the company has the same name, but its profile changes over the years. A business like General Electric would be a case in point. Um, or they have strategic agility. And strategic agility isn't seeing tomorrow. It's that when you see tomorrow, you have the capability to seize the opportunity. And Apple is a great example of that. And then absorption uh, refers to not just the ability to take punches, but also to uh, digest big, uh, big prospects when they come along. So we, we're finding the solutions quite clearly, but Carl, the big question is, are South African companies uh, able to adopt these particular practices? Are we finding that there are, I know that there are South African examples that you've sure. recently done a study on, but from your perspective, Carl, uh, are our leaders thinking in that dimension? I think certainly in the, in the uh, business environment, there's, there's lots of um, you know, leaders that are looking at uh, the absorption factor. I think it's, you know, it's, it's an adaptive. It's something that you have to do to survive. I mean, as you say, we've had a tough economic climate the last two years. So if you don't adapt and, and, and change in the, to the environment and, and look at new ways of doing things, you're not going to succeed. Mm -hmm. So certainly there's, there's, there's uh, many examples of that. Mm -hmm. uh, referring to the capabilities of agility and absorption, those are what I would refer to as second order capabilities. So, you know, businesses have typically understood how to compete. You know, you need to have leading market share, you need to be profitable. But uh, that, that formula, which has worked in the past, has, has stopped working. And when you look at that, you see the, a lot of volatility, not only in South Africa, but in world markets. So, for example, in the 80s, if you were a market share leader, it was a correlation of about 34% that you were also the leader in terms of your operating profit levels. So market share would uh, roughly equate to being also a profitability leader. If you look at where we are today, that now equates to only 7%. So only 7% of market share leaders actually are leading in terms of profitability. So it's, it's really turned the, you know, the standard ways of competing on their head. 
And then that's why you need to look at what are the second order capabilities that we need within our business strategy in order to help us be competitive within this market. So how do we infuse agility? How do we uh, infuse absorption? Um, how do we bring innovation um, in, a, in a sustainable and relevant way to our organizations? And that's probably where the example of uh, Apple comes in, because as you mentioned, not only were they the trendsetters and the leaders with regard to innovation, but also uh, agile and adapting to the market mm. and giving the, putting the consumer at focus here. Yeah, I'll probably alienate at least half the audience by say, saying that Apple invented almost nothing. They copied everything. Um, but, by being <laughs> but by being so quick to market, they, they carry the impression that they invented the mouse, that they invented the... Uh, the dial on uh, on the iPod and so on, um, and you know, Tammy's point about the the changing landscape. Perhaps you know, battle is a or war is a useful analogy in thinking about competing. You don't want to overdo the the caricature, but you know, conventional warfare uh, has you you know in in opposite trenches. This might be 1980s business where you can fire salvos across the trenches, mm -hmm. and you know, then we move into uh, Cold War in uh, uh, as a second strategy. The the battleground uh, that I would describe today is very unconventional warfare, where you may not even know what the enemy looks like. And th I won't choose telecoms and I won't choose banking. Uh, let me go somewhere where I might be a little safer. Uh, the motor industry and the motor industry is being disrupted by Tesla, and Elon Musk in putting Tesla together set down a single requirement for the engineers. None of them uh, is allowed to have worked in the motor industry before. Mm. So they have to bring, they have to break, break the business. They have to break the mold. I want us to explore that further because I think it goes back to the question regarding leadership. Uh, do, we, do we think that way? Do we, do, we, do we take on these challenges here, Carl? Do, do, you know, and Tammy, uh, from that perspective, because clearly it needs a, different, a change in the mindset. As you mentioned, uh, having larger market share isn't obviously the easiest way to do it. But are we thinking in that way? And also if we could delve into that specific uh, area that you brought up regarding diversification. Because uh, uh, having uh, shops in every market doesn't necessarily mean that that will boost your profits either. Yeah, I mean, if we're talking about profits, and it's something that I just wanted to add on to what Tammy said is, you know, the, what we really need to understand is what is driving that bottom line profit of the business. So it comes back to the old 80-20 principle. You know, you've got sort of probably 20% of what you're doing is generating 80% of your value. Are you spending your time and effort in the right places? So as a, as a, as a business owner, are you clear on what is actually driving the value to your business and is that what you're focusing on? And I think, you know, to your point around changing how things change over time, you know, that might change. So historically you may have made all of your profits in one area, but now because of whatever, for whatever reason, that's changed significantly over time. And you need to track that on an ongoing basis and be very clear on what those things are so that you can make sure that you're putting all of your effort in, in, in the right space, especially in a tough time when, the, you know, when you may have to pull back on staffing, etc. You need to make sure that you're actually focusing your time on, on where the value sits. Um, you know, and that, that cuts across things like product line services, your actual staff, and you want to make sure that you're keeping your, your, your top performers um, across all those aspects. I want to come back to the issue with regard to driving profitability and managing those cost controls, Carl, because clearly that is a particular issue, especially in tough times. And sometimes the most valuable resource in a company, which is its people, is often the first to go when it comes to cutting down costs. Uh, that particular strategy, the threats that are possessed there. I, th I think it actually touches on, an, on, a, on a broader theme as well from a leadership perspective. So when you get, get into tough times, often, often companies will pull back, stop communicating, and as you say, the first thing might be that you cut on staff, you might cut on marketing, those sort of things. If you take a slightly different approach and you're a little bit more um, open or, or, or transparent from, from a, the business perspective saying, these are the challenges we've got, these are the th this is how we can potentially solve it, looking at things like diff shortened work hours, you know, you, you get a lot more buy-in from the team and you can, and in fact, you might find that the people on the ground actually have a better idea how to solve some of the business problems than, than the people sitting in the sort of head office environment or in, 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 the, in the central entities. And I think, you know, that's something that we need to focus on a lot for, you know, from a business perspective is to make sure that, that you're getting all that feedback from, from the people on the front line mm. and that you're not cutting, to your point, just for, like from an accounting perspective to say, okay, we need to reduce headcount by X, but rather look at, 
you know, what, what, are, what are some of the, the, the other ways of, of, of reducing that cost, but, you know, shorter hours and those sort of things. Tammy, you alluded to the NDP earlier on in our discussion, and I want to pick your brain if uh, we have an enabling environment which encourages that. Uh, we know that the NDP has objectives to create jo gro job growth as well as spur economic growth. But that's difficult, uh, especially for business leaders, when it comes to actually facing the current economic environment and the landscape, especially coming back on the sentiments that Carl just alluded to. Yeah. Well, you know, I think one thing, um, one observation is South Africans are incredibly creative. And, and when you look at the, the new legislation around BE, for example, it, it really requires uh, businesses to have a very relevant and, and impactful investment in enterprise and supplier development that up until this point perhaps was was more of a, of a nuisance or you know there, there were ways to channel and to meet the legislation and so you know here you have policy which is actually requiring a significant uh, change in the, in the way that businesses will, will need to transform and at the same time we're having you know, challenges we're having um, companies who are perhaps oversupplied in terms of this, the staffing or they, don't, they probably don't have the right skills. So when you look at those two together, how can we actually say we have oversupply of uh, employees in, in certain sectors and at the same time we have the challenge of growing our suppliers? So how can we make some of those employees that perhaps need to be made redundant into our suppliers? And you know, so how can we take some of those workforces that have had a traditional model of employment and turn them into owner operators and channel some of the funding that's going through there? So you know, there there are opportunities um, that will not only bring you know compliance to policies, but also the opportunity for um, real economic growth as well. Mm -hmm. But we need to make sure that those funds um, and and it's appropriated um, in the in the right way, um, that it's managed not as policy compliance, but that it really um, aims to make a relevant impact in society as well. Adrian, from your perspective, do you agree? That does the NDP enable this? Uh, as desperately as I wish it did, <laughs> I don't think it does. Um, South Africa is over-regulated. Um, it's tough to start a, a, a small business. Um, it's tough to get into industries. We've got uh, oligopolistic industry structures, which is very much apartheid legacy and, uh, and then f f sort of fed or sustained by high regulatory barriers and boundaries. Um, and I think the, the, that red tape and those regulatory parameters need to be lifted, removed, eased. You know, in the same breath, I hear myself being uh, a very depressing economist. So let me be you know, a little bit more upbeat and acknowledge that there are instances where heavy regulation, uh, and maybe I want to say excessive regulation, actually feeds competitiveness. And this is an idea that, you know, this isn't new. Michael Porter recognizes this, that, um, for instance, I think one of the reasons why South African banks are globally competitive mm. is because our, of our incredible uh, domestic regulatory uh, architecture and capabilities. And Richard Pike from AdCorp says that when uh, he takes his business to Australia, um, the South African regulatory environment sets uh, AdCorp head and shoulders above uh, local competitors there because they've learned to deal with uh, these incredibly demanding uh, and I think he would venture onerous requirements. Takes us back to agility quite clearly then. <laughs> well, we are taking a short ad break. Do stay with us. We continue to unpack this discussion right after this. Welcome back to this episode of The Business Agenda. I'm still joined by my panelists today, Adrian Saville, Tammy Wyman, and Carl Gitter, who are telling us about uh, how to uh, weatherproof your business against the volatility regarding the economic landscape. And we've touched briefly on uh, the uh, uh, agility aspect at the beginning of this discussion, and maybe we'll delve into absorption in a little while. But I do understand that you have a report, the Digital Density Index, Tammy, uh, which uh, showed you some interesting insights that could be deployed by uh, business owners here in South Africa in in order to uh, be, see earnings growth. Yes. So certainly there's a, there's a lot of hype around digital and what is the impact of making digital investments. And, and companies are struggling with where do I invest, how much do I invest in. And 
countries as well, understanding, you know, sh should we put a lot of emphasis, for example, in the national broadband plan in, in achieving those targets and what is actually going to be the impact on the, in the economy. So at Accenture, what we did is we studied a number of the top uh, economies in the world. Unfortunately, South Africa wasn't included, so that's a, one of the challenges is to be included next year. Um, and what we did is we looked at about 60 different uh, factors which could measure the maturity of digital in that economy. So those factors were surrounded, uh, for example, on how can um, digital create new markets, either new products and services or a new way to engage with customers through digital technologies. Uh, how can digital help if uh, businesses be more efficient, digitizing processes, um, making their own um, internal efficiencies um, through digital. How can they source through digital any asset they need? So whether that is funding, whether that's uh, sourcing talent through digital, or even um, sourcing their direct or indirect inputs. And then finally, how good work economies or countries at fostering enablers for digital? So does the country have strong data privacy uh, regulation and laws? Uh, does a country provide access and funding for broadband penetration? And taking about 60 of those factors, what we did is we compared um, what would a, the equivalent of a 10-point increase in the digital density index, how does that impact economies? Globally, the impact on, on an annual basis um, from now until 2020, it's expected that it would be a 0.3% increase in GDP. And when we take an extract of emerging markets, we see that the impact is 0.5% of increase in GDP. So when we're looking at you know, how do we reach the, the, the uh, levels um, that the government is predicting in terms of GDP increase, there is a fundamental learning that if we do, as, an, as a country and as businesses, put emphasis on in increasing the digital density impact, that will have spillover into, into the GDP as well. And you know, that's a very strong message. Um, and I think it's a very strong message as well to the, to the policymakers and to the government um, to give further confidence um, to the private sector to continue to invest in digital technologies. Mm. Carl, maybe if we can explore that particular avenue, because we did touch on diversification from a geographic perspective, but uh, from a, a revenue streams element. Uh, clearly, digital is the opportunity here, where we know in South Africa we are so uh, delayed ever so slightly. Uh, but is this a particular trend that you think can assist uh, uh, in bolstering South Africa's economic performance and more importantly the performance of these exceptional companies? Sure, I mean I think most companies have a, some sort of digital strategy or a view around digital at this stage. Um, I, I guess the, the conundrum that and we as a bank are also facing this conundrum is how do you roll out the digital um, infrastructure which is obviously generally much lower cost but you've got to then take, try and take out some of the physical infrastructure that, you, that you're still sitting with. So I guess it also depends where you are in the business, you know, where you, what kind of a business you're sitting in. If you're a new startup you know, digital is really a great place to start. The, the cost base is very low. There's, there's a lot of, uh, of room to grow there. If you've got an existing business, it's a great thing to do on the side. Um, and we're seeing a lot of a take up in it. I mean, from a personal perspective, I, I know that nowadays I, I generally order most things online. In the evening, you come home, it saves you a lot of time on the weekends. You know, it's, it's, it's a very easy way of, 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 of doing business. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's it's something that's going to catch on more and more. When cell phone banking first came out, nobody really used it because it wasn't user friendly. But now, just about but everybody's using tablet banking or cell phone banking um, on an iPhone because it's so user friendly. And I guess that's the crux of it. It has to be very easy for the, for the customer to utilize. And, and in that instance, and the take up will be there. I think that's really what drives the take up. Coming back to the financiers' perspective, are we seeing that the funds are flowing in that particular direction uh, with regard to investment in digital? Yes, so there's, there's definitely um, a, lot of, a lot of investment happening in digital. Again, from a bank perspective, we're investing heavily in our own digital infrastructure. Companies are investing heavily in digital, in digital infrastructure going forward. Um, you know, Vodacom, MTN, heavy, heavy investment in, in rolling out fiber optics, etc., into, into many areas. Um, and that will definitely um, help help with the rollout going forward. It almost seems as though where the opportunity lies, that's where the private sector often tends to capitalize on. And we see that with a lot of the, the companies that do happen to pioneers, that the government might take a sluggish stance, but that's where the private sector sees opportunity. And Adrian, this brings me to the level of distrust that we see between these two particular sectors. Yes, we hear that the policies are there and the regulation is put in place and that the red tape does assist in making the South African private sector stand head and shoulders above its peers internationally. But is the communication taking place at an efficient level? 
I think, I think there's a, a fair chunk that's missing in action, and Tammy spoke earlier about uh, soft infrastructure. Um, and to her observations on soft infrastructure like health and education, uh, I would add uh, another element, which is uh, the degree of social trust. And South Africa doesn't stand alone here in our low level of social trust, but we stand uh, with economies that have come from behind the Iron Curtain, for instance, where there were traumas to society, and it takes determined and deliberate uh, and consistent action to, to remedy these social traumas and to build social trust. South Africa is uh, miles ahead today where we were 20 years ago, mm. but we've got somewhere to go still. And that, that dialogue, the social trust, um, the building of a coherent uh, fabric is critical. Uh, to, uh, to sustained economic growth. In the absence of that social trust, you will, uh, you'll just, uh, I suppose, put down the ingredients to repeat or uh, iterate the existing very skewed inequality, uh, high levels of entrenched unemployment, and so on. So that's, that's I think that that's key. And, as much as we look to public policy or the public sector to remedy this, this is everyone's job. Mm. And the private sector is not uh, immune or innocent uh, of having you know, perhaps broken trust in important places. The building and construction collusion is a case in point. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, it's a collective responsibility and it's important collective responsibility. Uh, I want to tie this back into the opportunities that were highlighted here, and maybe this is where absorption also comes into place uh, for companies to experience significant growth. If you could ex explore that element uh, a little bit further uh, with regard to finding the opportunities, and Tammy, you can also provide us perspective with regard to this, uh, uh, as you alluded to earlier on in this discussion, uh, but uh, absorbing the knocks, and maybe you can mm -hmm. even use the construction sector as one of the examples here, because Wilson Bailey Homes yeah. is one of those exceptional exceptionals. <laughs> I think it's, uh, the building and construction sector is a great example uh, of what happens when you've got agility and absorption. Because the Spanish construction firm, ACS, goes through the horrific uh, Spanish building recession with uninterrupted profit growth. Uh, and they have both of these uh, ingredients, agility and absorption. The fall off in infrastructure spend after the World Cup saw the boom of 08, uh, 09 in uh, building construction spend, engineering spend, uh, and you had a raft of companies coming to the JSC listing in that very buoyant uh, construction environment. Now they're in the business of consolidation, uh, reorganization, and in some uh, sad circumstances, bankruptcy. Yeah. And we've, uh, we see now a, a board that is collectively quite stressed uh, on, on the JSC, that building construction engineering cluster. Yet Wilson Bailey has been one of these businesses that has produced uh, this remarkable, uh, long, uninterrupted, uh, uh, top and bottom line performance record, uh, the cocktail of agility and absorption. Absorption, the clear element that we want to focus on here, Tammy, uh, finding those opportunities of value, as we heard uh, Adrian mention here. Uh, it's, it's a tough one, but I want us to use practical examples that the audience will be able to understand and business owners who are watching here will be able to have some key takeaway points. Sure. I think one of the most important things is um, you, as a business owner or a business leader, you need to be able to read signals of change and be able to act on them. Mm -hmm. And what I find that companies often fail most on is their ability to actually understand their own data, their own customer data. And if you, if you don't get that right, you're not going to be able to understand those signals of change that are coming from your environment, right? Because you have nothing to compare it against. So to, to put a practical example, um, Amazon, right? probably the, the only company that has survived for this long as a pure internet player. Strength of becoming a market disruptor, um, being able to become profitable within the internet space. Well, what is happening? As other companies are, are catching up to their ability to serve their customers online, 
for example, I'll give you a Best Buy or a Toys R Us, phys physical retailers. What they're finding is that consumers now like to have both the online and the retail element. And so perhaps it's more convenient in certain circumstances. Now, Amazon is at a point, you know, they're very proud of being the only internet only c company, but they're able to, to see these signals of change. And they're actually contemplating options such as even buying the US Postal Service, which is a company in distress. Uh, but what does it have? It has multiple retail locations in every single town in the United States. And, and I think, you know, rather than, than Amazon sitting back and saying, yeah, but we're the best in internet, so, you know, we, we can only continue. We are not a bricks and mortar company. They're acting on these signals of change and creating a strategy to enter into something which uh, seems to go against their core strategy. And, and that's very important to understand what is the preference of the consumer market or the business market that you're serving. If you don't understand that, you're not going to be able to pick up on those signals of change. Mm. Maybe if we can get some insights from our audience now, because I think those signals of change are often very difficult to decipher, or there's a stance of disbelief or, or, or aloofness, maybe for some from the, from the business leaders that we find in South Africa. Uh, if we do have comments from the floor, we do have a roving mic that is available. And uh, pose your questions and opinions to the panel. The mic will make its way to you. If you can please stand up and introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Darius Rasool from Standard Bank. Um, Adrian, a question for you. There was a, a reference earlier on in the discussion about the 5.4% uh, uh, in the growth in the GDP, I mean, in the NDP mm. plan. Uh, the question is, do you see solving for infrastructure as simple as that, uh, dealing with or getting us to 5.4%, assuming we had to, you know, uh, try and get there, given obviously all the challenges we have. Uh, is it as simple as solving for infrastructure? What are the other ingredients that we need to kind of put in to, to get us to that 5.4%? Thank you so much for your question. We'll take another one from the floor, so that we take them in at twos. My name is Raj Maharaj. I'm coming from the logistics background, a company called Freightworks. Uh, just chatting in the African market in, in, in a context with regards to uh, sort of diversification. I started up a chartering organization 15 years ago. Was very successful carrying cargo for the binds into Africa by air transport. If we had not diversified uh, at least 12 years ago into the road transport industry and the sea industry, we should not be around here today. What we found is not at the point in time in Africa when people need goods now, they would air freight it. But with what is happening in the economy now, people can't, companies can't afford to air freight. So had we not changed from air freight and sea freight to road freight to the neighboring countries, we would have been out of business today. So your question comes out and exactly what you're trying to tell us in terms of the, the agility mm -hmm. and the preparedness to change and to see what the clients want, not necessarily what you have, but be able to get into the market at the right time. So we could have just gone and uh, said we are charter operation and that's what we do. In three years of the business, my business would have closed. Mm -hmm. So just been having that, uh, that understanding of what the market required and what you were carrying to the mining industry uh, held us in a good stead that for the past 15 years, we have grown every year. Thank you. Before you sit down, Mr. Maharaj, I actually want to pick your brain on uh, being able to identify the trend from your customer's perspective. Did you get the support and the backing from financial institutions that were providing you with funding? Yes. Uh, I'm very proud to say from the time I started the business, uh, I was a Standard Bank. I'm still at Standard Bank, and I'll always be with Standard Bank. There's an audience <laughs> member who's happy with that. So uh, clearly you're doing something correct. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Let's pick up on the first question, which was obviously directed at you, Adrian. Uh, infrastructure and the other ingredients which might be necessary to bolster South Africa's economic growth. Mm. So going to uh, Darius Rasool's question about would infrastructure be enough? Uh, interestingly, you know, that infrastructure spend that I make reference to, the work that we've done uh, suggests that the infrastructure spend has the capacity to lever economic growth higher by about 1.5% per year on a sustained basis. And what I mean by a sustained basis is for the foreseeable future. Uh, you might be interested to know that that 1.5% includes the uh, digital infrastructure. Mm. Uh, so we've got in, in embraced in there the, the capabilities that are brought about by 
uh, uh, mobilization that is uh, moving bits and byte, bytes as well as moving atoms. Uh, and that would add one and a half uh, to take us from we think that the South African economy, the structure looks like three and a half, uh, sorry, three. We add one and a half to that and that gets us to four and a half. And then the connecting to the neighborhood is the other missing magic link. And that connecting to the neighborhood would add a further one and a half to take us to a six economy. Well, I hope Mr. Rasul is happy with that response. To come back to Mr. Maharaja's sentiments, uh, where he highlighted the agility and reading the market. Uh, and maybe we need to come back to Mr. Standard Bank to give us more perspective on this, who supported him. The client-centric vision. Uh, is that a new development that's taking place where we're finding business leaders are, are structuring their thinking around that? As mentioned by Mr. Maharaj, sometimes it is difficult to get stuck in uh, thinking that you are the know-all and the be-all when it comes to what your business can provide and what it has to offer and not thinking outside of the box to find new markets. Is this something that uh, obviously yourselves at Standard Bank have obviously adapted to, uh, but is it a change that you also need to instill in the, the, the clients that come to you? Yes, I think, I think it's very important. It's a great example, actually, of diversifying into, a, into another sort of income stream or another market. And I guess it, a lot of it comes back to understanding your data. So by looking at, I'm assuming, your sort of historical charter data, you could see there was a fall off coming there. And then you, you would look, OK, well, what are some of the alternatives that we can do? And you would start saying, OK, well, maybe road freight is something that it's similar to charter in certain aspects. So it's something that you understand, but it's also different. And there's a new opportunity to make money out of that. So I guess it's trying to take a little bit of what you know and, and applying that into a different market or a different industry and, and leveraging your skills from that perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I think the data is really important in these circumstances. So trying to predict where you're going, there's internal data that you've got in your business of your, your, your internal sales volumes, et cetera. You can look externally at, at confidence indexes, GDP forecasts, sales volumes, those sort of things to give you a little bit of an understanding of, of where you see the market going. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that should really then raise the flag and the trigger to, okay, now we're heading into this cycle. What is it that we need to do to adapt to that? Mm -hmm. Google, if I could just you know, throw in very quickly that one of the attributes that we find in the South African agile absorbers uh, replicates the attribute um, or, or mimics the ap a attribute that Rita McGrath finds in her global, global agile absorbers, and that is they bottom up businesses. That uh, whilst the business imperative seems to be we must you know, go away on a group X go and strategize and come back with a great plan, these companies show us time and time again that the people who know the most about your business are your customers. Yeah. And it would pay you well to listen to them. Uh, and you know, they, they feed you. No better case in point than uh, one of my favorite uh, business school examples is Kodak, uh, which insisted that they knew exactly what their customers wanted and they became world class in a redundant technology. Exactly, and had to file for, for liquidation, <laughs> Kelly, whereas Fuji uh, had the upper hand. Yeah. Exactly. Tell me, maybe if you can provide us perspective with this, because uh, Mr. Maharaj did also allude to the geographic diversification, which Adrian also shared his sentiments on. It's a tricky landscape. Africa's made up of 54 states and maybe different customers with different needs. Yeah. Well, I, I would actually um, challenge, you know, this, this could be coming from anywhere, but, you know, when, what you're looking at, essentially, you're taking, I think you mentioned the mining sector. You know, the customer need is they need certain materials to be on site in order for them to be productive. Well, then, you know, look at what are the emerging substitutes for that. We have 3D printing. You know, are some of those pieces that you are actually delivering to them, are they going to be able to print those on site? Also, an emerging technology is self-assembly. Mm -hmm. So you, you can get almost a, you know, well, it's a very nascent technology, but, you know, it's envisioned that a bridge comes in a flat pack and there's a chemical reaction in the elements that constitute it, and then it starts assembling itself. I mean, those are very fascinating technologies, but at the pace that we're moving, you may find yourselves within three to five years having some disruption. You know, you, you could realize, well, actually, I'm only getting 95% of the volumes I was getting before. Well, you know, because they've bought a 3D printer on site. And then the, in another three to five years, then they've done something else, something else. So, you know, you may find yourself being disrupted out of this core need, which was having materials on site. 
So, you know, it's, it's uh, provocative thinking, but you need to be there looking at those signals for change in your industry. Mm -hmm. Are there self-assembling power stations in town? <laughs> that would be fantastic, yeah. I have one in my pocket, actually. <laughs> oh, that would be fantastic. I actually want to find out from the audience members if there are any uh, of those who are participants in the technology sphere, because clearly that's being highlighted uh, as a key area for, for, for innovation as well as investment, uh, potentially. And maybe you can give us more insights on that, Carl. But any players in the technology sphere? I see some of, there we go. Maybe if you can share your insights with us, ma'am, uh, how this is uh, naturally changing the landscape of the business environment in South Africa. There's a microphone behind you, Mr. Scholes. Thank you so much. Good morning. My name is Martina. I'm the owner of Tatama Consulting, which is a very small uh, IT risk company, though I'm not so technical at this point, but uh, I manage risk within the technical sphere. And uh, my opinion, based on the work that I have been doing, is that uh, companies, as much as they understand and realize that uh, technology is a key driver, they are pulling back on their spending to make sure that the technology enables them to make sure that they grow as quickly as they can. And uh, not only looking at technology, but only looking at those soft issues as well that are critical to make sure that we educate our juniors, we educate our youth to make sure that they grow with the organizations technologically and otherwise to make sure that the organization grow as well. Thank you so much for your comments here. Yeah. I'd actually like to get your perspective here, Carl. Is this also not where commercial plays an influence in driving the push for investment in technology? And maybe, uh, Tammy, you can also come in to give us your thoughts here. Yeah, Carl? I think technology investment is key in, in, in businesses going forward. I mean, it's it can really create huge efficiencies in your business and take out a, a large chunk of, of, of cost from your from your business. It can change the way that you engage with clients. I mean, the, the, the example of the iPad and the, the, that we were mentioning earlier, you know, whether it was uh, originally created or not, you know, <laughs> the, the impact on people's lives has been huge. Um, the, the way that you, you bank, the way that you buy goods, the way that you, you engage with people, you know, it, it's, it's fundamentally changed the way that we do business. And I think if, we don't, if you don't embrace technology, you probably find yourself pretty redundant, you know, five, ten years down the road. Mm. And it's changing so so much quicker, you know, things that have, if you look at what's changed in the last five years, you go five years forward, it's actually quite scary to imagine what we'll be doing in five years time, um, because it's, it's just so ever changing and so fast. So I think it's key to be, to be at the, you know, understand what's happening in that space. Which goes back to the data comment that you had, uh, Tamir, but clearly it's changing very fast and quickly, we need to catch up. Yeah, uh, I, I think that the CIO's role is very challenging and obviously you're, you're advising CIOs. You, when we look at what the CIOs spend the majority of their time in, it's actually keeping the lights on, you know, ke keeping what's there up and running, keeping it efficient. And they have very little time to actually plan for the future. And then there are so many choices that are out there in terms of technology. You know, we've got a lot of very relevant cloud offerings, which, which actually change the entire investment profile. And a CIO's role is very challenging, and what they end up spending less time is actually around innovation. And there's an expectation from the organization that the CIO's, uh, that the unit actually brings that innovation to the, to the company as well. So it also creates this um, blank space around innovation where there's an expectation that is coming from the CIO's office, but the CIO actually doesn't even have the capacity to... to, to focus on it. Um, so that's a, another area where we're finding that, you know, how, how do we take innovation away from, uh, or let's say, not away from the technology space, but how do we bring it into a larger area of the company and not um, only make it the responsibility of the CIO? Mr. CIO of Canon Asset <laughs> Managers, <laughs> do you agree? Yeah, very tough job. <laughs> yeah uh, I would say in this case, fortunately, my eye is investment, not uh, uh, info. But, um, yeah, you know, I think the seduction is to is to try and imagine that you can see the next big thing, and the the, the Apple example is a useful one because in in these agile absorbers, the global and the South African agile absorbers, they don't necessarily uh, invent the next wave, mm. but they are they have the ability to get onto that wave when they see it. Uh, and in, certainly in some instances, they are uh, wave creators. Uh, I think it would be remiss not to suggest that some of them have been disruptors. But those that aren't disruptors uh, are move quick enough to be able to ride uh, those waves rather than, uh, than watch. And I think this underscores the importance of this cocktail of agility and absorption. If you have 
uh, lots of absorption but no agility, you're really just a cash cow and you're the walking dead. Uh, it, it, it's only time before you die. And I think this is a, uh, this is a risk to, to large, established, entrenched players in, uh, in concentrated industries. Mm. I think there's a couple of good South African examples uh, of that. Uh, perhaps mobile telephony is, is a good example and WhatsApp uh, is in the business of disrupting spectacularly. Tammy, you'd be happy because technology has clearly come up as a particular theme here. But uh, SMMEs have also been highlighted to help boost economic growth here in South Africa. But it is a challenging environment for them, as you've alluded to, the red tape, the sluggish economic environment, and a lack of support sometimes that we see in the industry. I'm sure there must be other uh, uh, owners of SMMEs here in South Africa or business owners who might be finding it challenging. And this is your opportunity to uh, pose your question to the panel as to where to start. Uh, maybe you might have a successful business plan on paper, but is is it agile enough to uh, adhere to the challenges in the local market and absorb those pressures while still uh, diversifying and being a potential threat to the big players? I'm sure there's, there's someone here who's a leader at their company. If there is, could you please uh, stand up and uh, give us your sentiments as to how you feel with regard to this? The mic will make its way to you, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Kojo. I'm from Lance Engineering. We're based in Roslyn in Pretoria. Um, we're a small company. We supply the likes of BM, Nissan, Afrit, uh, a lot of car manufacturers, and we had to diversify and start supplying others, the likes of Avenge. Um, I'd say in our case, we've actually had to become hyper agile. Mm -hmm. In a specific day, telecom and ESCOM can be down in our area. Mm -hmm. And now we then rely on our cell phones, get Wi-Fi going around the office, had to get laptops for everyone. So with, the, with where being agile is concerned, I think we're fine. But how do we then become more, um, if we see an opportunity, how do we take advantage of that opportunity? Because we don't have a strong enough balance sheet to take on that opportunity. I mean, the likes of Standard Bank, which we also bank with, they help here and there. But sometimes an opportunity <laughs> requires, you know, a, a big amount of money to take advantage of. And how do we, as a small company, take advantage? How can we, how can we deal with that? How do we handle it? Could you thank you so much for your question. We do have two minutes to address his question and uh, wrap it up. So it's on a good note, practical examples that an entrepreneur like Kujo can make use of. Uh, let's start with you, Tammy. Uh, we'll give you some time, Carl, to uh, think of alternative <laughs> methods of funding. Uh, uh, Tammy, your perspective? Well, I think it's about bringing two groups together because w one of the keys to being agile uh, for the large corporates now is about creating a partner, e partner ecosystem. Whereas before they were able to you know, manage their business largely on their own, I think a classic example is Microsoft, you know, dominant market leader for two decades, three decades. Well, what they, what they now have to do is create a partner ecosystem. And they're, they're making some acquisitions, but then other businesses you'll find that they have to create a partnership. So they, they are uh, thirsty for tapping into businesses like yours, trying to find them because it's an understanding that they'll need other businesses, uh, small businesses as channels, providing innovation to their own products and service suites. So I, I think a, a real a key is bringing together these different groups. Again, I referred to the ESD funding, which is going to be increased. You know, that, that's also a vehicle where we're seeing our clients saying, you know, how do we you know, make our investment in ESD relevant? And how do we find those companies that are going to most benefit from it and become our suppliers or our partners? Uh, it, there's no secret to it, but you know, I, I think you, know, you really need to be um, very active in those networks where you are bringing together corporates and SMEs. Mm -hmm. Carl, before we come to you uh, to give us the last uh, and closing comments of the day, Adrian, maybe if we can get your perspective uh, on uh, uh, the opportunities that sure. uh, Koja can uh, So while Carl goes for his credit committee. Um, exactly. <laughs> 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 uh, I, rather than talk about accessing the credit, because I, I think that that is available, um, and there's lots of avenues in South Africa, if not uh, a standard bank itself, um, to think about why uh, you're going to do this and then how you're going to do it. And the lessons we get from the agile absorbers is if you're going to bet, bet often, bet small, bet close, um, and don't bet to the extent that it makes you thin. Uh, you actually want to bet with a fat balance sheet. Uh, and where you make yourself thin to try and buy agility, that loss of absorption can actually pull you over. Um, and so hopefully that it gives you some uh, ideas in terms of how to bet and where to bet uh, and now to call to 
get the money. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, the partnering piece, I think you've, you've touched on, you can always go with somebody with a, with a large balance sheet. From a bank perspective, I think at Standard Bank, we, we definitely realize entrepreneurs are what drives the economy. I mean, f for us, it's, we really want to grow the South African economy, and we want to, we want to give more credit where, where it makes sense. So we are internally looking at, at how we can do more with entrepreneurs and, 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 and be a little bit more open to, to, to those sort of things. At the end of the day, we do need to obviously compensate on, you know, with, from the risk perspective as well. So it's a bit of a balancing act. It's a tough balancing act. We know we've probably got a, a way to go in that space, but we, we really are trying hard to, to, to make access to funding a lot easier, specifically in the, in the commercial banking space. And the point is that it's an ongoing conversation, both amongst entrepreneurs as well as the financiers exactly. and individuals who can provide the support for these particular businesses. Thank you so much uh, to our panelists today. It does bring this uh, particular episode of the business agenda to an end. A big thank you once more to Adrian Saville, Chief Investment Officer of Canon Asset Managers and Chief Strategist at Citadel Group, uh, Tammy Wyman, Managing Director at Accenture Strategy, and the man with the money, Carl Gitter, uh, from Commercial Banking at Standard Bank. And until next time, thank you for joining us.